everyone. And uh, I'm excited to uh, uh, announce uh, this new thematic uh, seminar series on, on the on the call, plan the call. And uh, we have a, a very exciting lineup. And uh, today is the first uh, seminar uh, in this series and, and was uh, given by uh, Rebecca Fisher from Harvard University. And uh, follow up, uh, there will be uh, several talks on the core composition, but as you see, uh, and Jack Lee will be more focused on the uh, geochemistry experiment side of the composition uh, to address the composition of the S core. Uh, Lindaka uh, Vocadro and will, from uh, University uh, College of London will be more from the uh, first principle calculation theory uh, and the directions. And then finally, we will have some perspective on the seismologist and how they do the observations of the core. And uh, so it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Rebecca Fishing today. And uh, she's gonna be uh, talk about the core formations and I assume will be a, a really set up the stage for, you know, modeling aspect as well as uh, uh, and uh, some of the observation how to be incorporated in the modeling. And uh, I knew Rebecca from her graduate school year, actually started in the University of Maryland with Andy Ca Campbell and then moved to Chicago. And so she got her, her PhD in University of Chicago and uh, uh, subsequently uh, got an NSF graduate fellowship and worked with uh, um, uh, Smith, at the Smithsonian and the UC Santa Cruz, and uh, uh, and and then uh, 2017, she joined the faculty at Harvard University, and uh, uh, so she has been very active in this areas, and I'm really looking forward to hear and uh, the latest and the, some of the. Uh, uh, development and on the core formation models. And uh, Rebecca, I will let you share the screen. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction and the invitation. Uh, and thank you all for coming today. Um, so I'm gonna be talking to you about core formation, which I would argue is uh, one of the most important processes that a planet goes through in its formation and early evolution, because to first order, it's what sets the initial composition of the core and the mantle. So I always like to start with a brief overview of how the terrestrial planets formed and evolved. So very early on, we had this disk of gas and dust in orbit around the proto-sun. And as the disk cooled, uh, dust condensed out and these dust grains uh, stuck together and formed gradually larger and larger solid bodies uh, that we call planetesimals and planetary embryos. So these are the building blocks of the planets. Uh, and, and these bodies then uh, continued to accrete they, they, in a series of increasingly large and violent collisions until we formed the four terrestrial planets that we see today. Uh, meanwhile, while these planets were accreting, they were simultaneously differentiating. Their metallic cores were segregating out from the silicate mantles. Energetic impacts on the surface caused large-scale melting, generating a partial or global magma ocean. And the metal from these impactors uh, reacted with this molten silicate at high pressures and high temperatures uh, before it sank down to join the core. And these, these reactions at extreme pressures and temperatures are what set the initial compositions of the core and mantle uh, that we still see evidence of in the terrestrial planets today. Uh, so this talk is gonna be roughly divided into four parts. I'm gonna start with some introduction and some background information that we need to know before we can model the process of core formation. Then the second part of the talk, uh, I'll present a model of Earth's core formation, um, mostly focusing on trace elements in the mantle and light elements in the core. Then in the third part, we're going to build on that model by incorporating the hafnium tungsten isotopic system. And in the fourth part of the talk, uh, I'll describe a model of core formation on Mars and uh, how this process was similar and different from on Earth 
Uh, and if there's time, I'll touch on some of the geophysical implications. Uh, okay, so to start with some introduction, why do we study core formation? Uh, well, fundamentally, it's a very ubiquitous process. Uh, we know that it occurred on the four terrestrial planets in our solar system and the Earth's moon. Uh, it occurred on a number of meteorite parent bodies, uh, some of the satellites in the outer solar system, uh, and probably on a bunch of exoplanets. Um, it's such a, a widespread process that we want to understand how it works. Uh, and we do this primarily using Earth and to a lesser extent Mars as case studies, since these are planets where we have the best data to compare to. So we want to understand things like the time, uh, timing of core formation, uh, the depth at which metal and silicate equilibrated, and the extent to which they equilibrated with each other. And core formation is important to understand because of its uh, role in determining the composition of a planet. Uh, and this is sort of a, a, a two-way street. If we think we know something about the process of core formation, uh, we can use this to predict something about composition. For example, the composition of a planet's core, which is otherwise inaccessible. Uh, alternatively, if we know something about the composition of a planet, uh, usually its mantle composition, uh, we can use this to sort of back out some information about how the core formation process worked. Uh, so in this talk, we're going to be doing uh, both of these approaches. Uh, so one good example of this uh, is trying to understand the light elements in the Earth's core. So we know that the core is mostly uh, made of iron with a little bit of nickel, uh, but that it's also got something else in it. Um, so this figure is showing density as a function of pressure over the pressure range of the Earth's core. So we're going from the core mantle boundary on the left to the center of the Earth on the right. And the top curve is the density of iron uh, based on experimental data um, calculated at the pressures and temperatures of the Earth's core. Uh, and the lower curve is PREM, the seismologically determined density of the core. And you can see in the outer core, there's about a 10% offset between these two curves that we call the density deficit. And most of this is thought to be due to the presence of one or more light elements dissolved in the core, elements like oxygen, silicon, sulfur, carbon, or hydrogen. Uh, so we can, the, these elements probably got there during the core formation process. So if we, if we model core formation, we can use that to predict how much of each of these elements should be there. Uh, and it's important to understand the identities and abundances of these elements uh, for a variety of reasons. They play an important role in uh, generating the Earth's magnetic field, uh, because as the inner core crystallizes, uh, they are preferentially excluded and they rise buoyantly in the outer core and help drive convection. Uh, if we understood the light element composition of the Earth's core, that would tell us something about the thermal structure of the deep Earth, because these different elements depress the melting point of iron by different amounts. Uh, and they affect all kinds of other properties uh, of iron as well, the rheological properties in the inner core, electrical and thermal conductivity, et cetera. Okay, so if we wanna model the core formation process, uh, we have to understand um, the process of accretion since this was happening simultaneously. Uh, and to do this, we turn to n-body simulations. So these are uh, simulations with a large number of bodies n in orbit around the sun. And we let them orbit the sun and interact gravitationally. And whenever they collide with one another, they're assumed to merge and accrete to form a larger body. Uh, so I'm going to show you a movie of what one of these simulations looks like. Um, this one uh, was taken from Raymond et al. 2006, um, but the ones I'm using uh, in the core formation model going forward are very similar to this. Um, so here the horizontal axis is semi-major axis, so the sun is at zero. Uh, these little colored dots are all of the planetesimals and planetary embryos that the planets are going to form out of. Uh, they're color-coded based on where they start out the simulation so that you can visualize the mixing that occurs. Uh, this big black circle here is Jupiter, uh, and Saturn is also included off-scale. And then the vertical axis is eccentricity, so how elliptical each body's orbit is. And you can think of this as a proxy for how likely it is to run into something else, since uh, bodies on more elliptical orbits are going to cross the orbits of other bodies more frequently. Uh, so when I, when I uh, start the movie, you're going to see this clock in the upper right start counting up in millions of years, and the bodies are going to fly around. Uh, 
Um, and keep your eye on the planet that's forming near 1 AU. That's our Earth analog. Okay, so we get these spikes in eccentricity caused by uh, orbital resonances with Jupiter and Saturn. And then we start to form a small number of larger bodies with low eccentricity and a large number of small bodies with high eccentricity uh, through processes like dynamical friction. And if we, we watch this Earth analog right here at 1 AU, see it's, it's red right now. It just turned orange, yellow, green. Uh, and it's just going to get gradually more blue. Um, so basically, it, it starts out by accreting mass near 1 AU, and as time goes on, uh, it accretes more material from further out in the disk. And after 85 million years of simulation time, uh, it's formed one, two, three, or four maybe terrestrial planets, um, and this debris that's sort of left over would get cleared up if we ran it for longer. Um, but that's that's basically how this works. So. Uh, we ran a suite of 100 simulations that are, are sort of similar to this um, that formed a total of 73 Earth analogs uh, defined based on their mass and semi-major axis. And there's two main pieces of information that we are going to extract from these simulations um, to, to uh, better inform our core formation model. Um, one is the mass evolution of the Earth. Uh, so this figure is showing the, the mass fraction of the Earth as a function of time from 50 of our simulations. And you can see that, that uh, accretion is a very stochastic process. So some of these Earth analogs uh, approach their final mass in only a few tens of millions of years. Um, others take over 100 million years. Some follow relatively smooth curves by accreting mostly smaller bodies. Um, but a lot of them have one or more very large impacts. Um, so we use a very large number of simulations when we do this uh, because it gives us a sense of this range of variability that's possible um, and also it gives us a better constraint on sort of the median outcome. Um, and the other thing that we're extracting from these simulations is information about provenance. That is what the earth accreted, where that material originated in the solar system, when it was accreted. Uh, this is also a very stochastic uh, aspect of accretion. Um, and it's important because it's thought that there were radial gradients in the disk in terms of things like redox state uh, and volatile contact. Um, and as we saw in the uh, movie there, the feeding zone of a planet tends to expand with time. So Earth accretes more material from further from the sun at later times. Okay, so that's our, our brief introduction to accretion. Um, the other main piece of information we need to know to be able to model core formation is information about these, these chemical reactions taking place between metal and silicate uh, at high pressures and high temperatures as the core is forming. Uh, and we do this uh, using experiments uh, in a laser heated diamond anvil cell. At least that's what my group uh, uses. Um, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some data from, from one of our earlier studies. Um, basically, we, we take a mixture of metal and silicate that resemble core and mantle materials, and we compress them between the tips of two diamonds to generate high pressures, uh, in this case, between 31 and 100 GPA. Uh, so for reference, the core mantle boundary is 135 GPA. Uh, and then while it's being held at those pressures, we heat it up with infrared lasers. Um, to completely melt the metal and silicate. Um, in this case, temperatures up to 5,700 Kelvin. Um, and we've doped uh, the experiments with some trace elements of interest so that we can look at the metal silicate partitioning behavior of nickel, cobalt, vanadium, chromium, silicon, and oxygen. Um, so after the experiment, we shut off the laser uh, to sort of freeze in the chemistry. We decompress the sample. Uh, and then we cut a thin slice uh, out through the laser heated spot uh, using a focused ion beam. Uh, and then we put the samples in a transmission electron microscope um, to look at them and measure their compositions. So on the left here uh, is an experiment recovered from 57 GPA and 4,400 Kelvin. Uh, this dark round feature uh, in the middle is the quenched metallic melt. And then it's surrounded by the quenched silicate melt. And then outside of that is the, the unmelted starting material. 
Uh, so we measure the compositions of the metallic and silicate melts uh, to get a sense for each element's preference for the two phases. Um, and on the right is a, a very analogous experiment, but this one's from 100 GPA and 5,700 Kelvin. Um, and what's cool about this experiment is that at these really extreme pressures and temperatures, we found nine weight percent silicon and 11 weight percent oxygen dissolved in the metal. Um, that is a lot of light elements. That's significantly more than the Earth's core contains. Um, so that's great. That means that we are uh, interpolating between our data um, in, in trying to understand the core formation process on Earth rather than having to extrapolate. Um, and so the goal of these experiments is to parameterize the partitioning behavior of each element as a function of variables like pressure and temperature. Um, so we quantify its partitioning behavior as an exchange coefficient KD, uh, which is a ratio of partition coefficients D. Um, and it's defined in terms of the mole fractions of uh, nickel, as, as the example in this case, and iron in both the metal and the silicate. So we can measure these four things uh, in each of our recovered samples. Uh, and that gives us KD. And then we know the pressure and the temperature of the experiment. Uh, and so we put together a data set and we can fit these three terms uh, that describe how the partitioning of nickel varies with pressure and temperature. Um, so that's what's being shown in this figure. This is a log of KD for nickel. So a higher value means that nickel is more siderophile. It more strongly prefers the metal. And then the horizontal axis is inverse temperature or temperature on the top axis. Uh, and each of these lines uh, is uh, calculated from the fit for a constant pressure. Um, and so one of the, the points I want to impress here is that um, to, to really parameterize the behavior of an element requires data covering a very wide range of pressures and temperatures and oxygen fugacities and compositions. And uh, it's difficult or impossible to do all of that in one study. Um, so to, to, to really understand this, uh, we put together data from a very large uh, amount of, of literature. Here, um, for example, we have 109 partitioning experiments for nickel taken from 13 studies. Um, and so each data point that you see here is one of these extremely labor intensive experiments. Um, so we were the ones who like fit this equation, but only a small number of the experiments are ours. It's, it's really a, a community driven effort um, to understand the behaviors of these elements. Uh, and so we did this for nickel, cobalt, vanadium, chromium, silicon, and oxygen, and other studies have done this uh, for a number of other elements as well. Okay, so that's our, our uh, quick background information. Uh, accretion simulations give us information like the mass evolution and provenance of the earth and high pressure temperature experiments um, give us information about the metal silicate partitioning behavior of the elements we're interested in. So now we can take that information uh, and put it into a core formation model for the earth. So we start with the output from the end body simulations and we assign each body an initial composition. Uh, this is basically a CI chondrite composition enriched in refractory elements and equilibrated at a particular FO2. And we use a more reduced FO2 in the inner disk uh, and a more oxidized FO2 in the outer disk. Uh, and then we track through uh, the accretion history of the earth analog. And every time uh, it accretes something, it, it undergoes an episode of core formation uh, with high pressure temperature metal silicate partitioning. Um, so for the, the Next few slides, the first results I'm going to show you, uh, we do the calculation assuming full equilibration between the metal and silicate happening at 55% of the Earth's core mantle boundary pressure at the time. So this is uh, sort of always increasing as the Earth grows. Uh, and the mantle liquid is temperature at that pressure. Uh, and these are, these are variables in the model that we're going to uh, relax later. Um, so we, we impose an initial FO2 gradient in the disk, but then as the Earth is growing, we allow its oxygen fugacity to evolve self-consistently. So this is a, a function both of what the Earth is accreting, but also um, there's changes in oxygen fugacity due to metal silicate partitioning of elements like oxygen and silicon. Uh, 
So we calculate the compositions of the equilibrating metal and silicate using a series of mass balance equations and experimentally determined partition coefficients, uh, like the ones on the previous slide. Um, and once we equilibrate them, the metal gets added to the core, the silicate gets mixed into the mantle, uh, and then we wait for the next impact. Um, so doing a calculation like this, the final core and mantle compositions represent some integration over a range of pressures and temperatures. Uh, so the model includes uh, these elements plus some others that aren't on here. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on six elements in particular, silicon and oxygen as light elements in the core, nickel and cobalt as trace elements in the mantle, and hafnium and tungsten, uh, which define a chronometer. Uh, and this is an example of, of the calculation. This is showing the silicon and oxygen contents of the core um, as a function of, of the mass growing uh, with time. Um, and this is for three of the earth analogs that formed in our simulations. And I, I chose these three because they each form an earth analog that's almost exactly one earth mass. So the variation you see in the final core composition is due solely to what the earth accreted in this simulation. Uh, mainly, it's an effect of, of the redox of what it accreted. So when the Earth accretes more reduced material, you get a higher silicon to oxygen ratio. And if we look across uh, all of our Earth analogs that formed in the n-body simulations, we can make a histogram like this. Uh, and we find the, the sort of most likely core composition is, is about 1.9 weight percent oxygen and 5.5 weight percent silicon. Um, so consistently, we see both silicon and oxygen in the core. Um, this was not necessarily expected based on lower pressure experiments uh, due to this uh, sort of competing redox effects, um, but it's very consistent with what we see in the very high PT experiments. Uh, we also find there's likely more silicon than oxygen in the core. Um, that tends to be uh, what we get when we match the mantle's composition, which I'm going to get to in a couple of slides. Uh, and if we compare this amount of light elements to the core's density, uh, this ought to account for a pretty good fraction of the density deficit. There might be room for small amounts of uh, other light elements like carbon, sulfur, or hydrogen. Uh, so I just wanted to say a few words quickly about those elements. Um, they are not incorporated into our model yet, um, but they are just starting to be uh, investigated experimentally. Uh, we did a study uh, that just came out a year ago on the partitioning behavior of carbon. Uh, so this is one of our experiments and uh, some nanosims maps that we made of it uh, that were actually done at Carnegie. Um, and there was a, a similar study done by Sewer et al. in 2017 looking at sulfur. Um, and we found that both carbon and sulfur become significantly less siderophile at very high pressures and temperatures. And when you put these data into a simple core formation model, uh, we calculated that the core would contain a maximum of about 0.1 to 0.2 weight percent carbon, uh, or about 1 to 2 weight percent sulfur. Uh, and this is a maximum uh, because the calculations here are assuming that the mantle's inventory of these elements is due solely to core formation uh, without a contribution from a late veneer. Uh, but these kinds of carbon and sulfur abundances in the core are very consistent uh, with volatile depletion trends calculated by McDonough in 2003. Uh, compared to silicon and oxygen, uh, of course, this is a, a lot less carbon, um, but sort of similar amounts of sulfur. Um, and in both cases, this would account for the vast majority, something like 80 or 90% of the Earth's carbon or sulfur budget being in the core. Um, hydrogen, uh, I will say, is much more controversial even than carbon and sulfur, which are already pretty controversial. Um, to my knowledge, there's no data on hydrogen metal silicate partitioning uh, from the diamond anvil cell at really high pressures and temperatures. Um, but there are certainly data at more modest pressures and temperatures, and the different studies disagree with each other. Um, hydrogen has a number of additional experimental and analytical difficulties that are, are very difficult to overcome. Okay, so coming back to our, our core composition, uh, we had 1.9 weight percent oxygen, 5.5 weight percent silicon, maybe one or two weight percent sulfur, less than 0.2 weight percent carbon, maybe a little hydrogen. 
Um, this thought would put us somewhere in the right ballpark in terms of the core's density. Um, but of course, this is definitely a non-unique solution, and this is not actually the right way to do this calculation. To, to do it right, you need to have all of the elements in the calculation at the same time. Uh, really, you need them all in the experiment at the same time, uh, and we don't have that yet. Um, but this is uh, maybe something somewhere in the right ballpark uh, based on uh, what the metal silicate partitioning data are telling us. Okay, so um, in order to, to say anything about the composition of the core, we have to know that the model conditions that we've chosen uh, to do this calculation with are realistic. Um, so to do that, we look at the mantle's composition. Uh, and it turns out that the trace elements in the mantle, uh, things like nickel and cobalt, are really sensitive uh, to the conditions of core formation. Uh, so here are our histograms uh, for all of our earth analogs in terms of their mantle, nickel, and cobalt concentrations uh, compared to the actual earth value, which is the, the shaded bar here. And you can see that the, the conditions that gave us sort of plausible core compositions in terms of the density um, also allow us to match earth's mantle trace element abundances. Um, so that gives us some confidence that our model is working and that the conditions we've chosen are plausible, if not actually correct. Um, so now we can start to sort of tune the different variables in the model and see how that affects things. Um, so the first one we're going to look at uh, is partial equilibration of the core. So this is the idea that if the earth accreted something that was large and differentiated, the core of this impactor might have quickly merged with the earth's core without having time to really equilibrate in the magma ocean. Um, so geochemical estimates of the degree of metal equilibration, uh, which we call K, uh, range from about 30 to 80%. And we know that this likely varied from impact to impact based on things like the impactor size and the impact angle and velocity. Um, but we don't have a very good handle on how it should have varied with these different things. So for now, we treat it as, as a constant that's the same for every impact. Uh, and you should think of that as some sort of like effective average, um, not necessarily that it's actually the same in every impact. Um, so these were the results I just showed you. This was for all of the incoming metal equilibrating at 55% of the core mantle boundary pressure. Uh, and this was the, the nickel and cobalt and silicon and oxygen in the core that we found. And then if we do the exact same calculation, but now only equilibrate 40% of the incoming metal, uh, the distributions here both shift to the left and we get uh, lower amounts of nickel and cobalt and less silicon and oxygen in the core. Uh, although you'll notice that some of the earth analogs uh, are still match the earth. Um, but what's interesting is that if we uh, keep this 40% of equilibration, but now shift the calculation to higher pressures and temperatures, we recover the same nickel and cobalt abundances in the mantle and almost the same silicon and oxygen contents of the core. So there's very strong trade-offs, uh, it turns out, between the depth of equilibration and the amounts of both metal and silicate, uh, which I didn't show you here, uh, that equilibrate. Uh, and it turns out that the composition of the core and mantle um, is most sensitive to uh, particularly the amount of metal that equilibrates and the depth of equilibration, as well as uh, sort of the redox of what the earth accretes. Um, so these are, are the factors that should be targeted in future experimental and numerical studies. Yeah, it's very difficult to put constraints on them from this type of model due to these very strong trade-offs. Okay, so from this core formation model, um, when we match the composition of the mantle, we get something like five and a half weight percent silicon and two weight percent oxygen in the core, possibly leaving room for a little bit of sulfur, carbon, and or hydrogen. Uh, there's really strong trade-offs between a bunch of the parameters uh, in this model that composition is most sensitive to. Um, so they should be targeted in future studies. Uh, and that's what led us um, to do uh, this next study uh, where we uh, added the hafnium tungsten isotopic system to our core formation model. Uh, so a quick primer on the hafnium tungsten system. Um, 182 hafnium decays to 182 tungsten with a half-life of 9 million years. Uh, and that's convenient because that's a, a similar order of magnitude to uh, accretion and core formation on the terrestrial planets. And the other thing that's really convenient about the system is that hafnium is lithophile, so it stays in the mantle during core formation, uh, 
uh, whereas tungsten is moderately siderophile. It mostly goes into the core. Um, so this means that uh, after core formation, most of the tungsten goes into the core. Uh, 182 half name in the mantle will then decay to create an excess of 182 tungsten in the mantle relative to the other stable isotopes of tungsten. Uh, and this is quantified as a tungsten anomaly uh, using epsilon notation. So it's, it's basically the amount of 182 tungsten in the mantle normalized to a stable isotope of tungsten and ratioed to a chondritic value in parts per 10,000. Uh, so in these units, uh, the Earth's mantle has a value of 1.9. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some cartoons uh, to illustrate how the half moon tungsten system is sensitive both to the timing and conditions of core formation. So in terms of timing, uh, we're going to consider two extreme end member cases. The first is very, very late core formation. So we start out, uh, this is a, a slice through our planets. Uh, it's undifferentiated and full of 182 half medium atoms. Uh, as time passes, those decay into 182 tungsten atoms. And then at some very late time, a core forms. And almost all of the 182 tungsten atoms go into the core. Uh, in particular, it goes into the core at the same rate as all of the other isotopes of tungsten. So you end up with no excess 182 tungsten in the mantle. So the other extreme end member case we can think about is very, very early core formation. So we start uh, again with an undifferentiated body full of 182 hafnium. Now the core forms really early. All of that hafnium stays in the mantle uh, where it then decays into 182 tungsten over time. So you end up with this big excess of 182 tungsten in the mantle relative to the stable isotopes of tungsten that all went into the core back in the stage. Uh, so you can see by just looking at the end stages of, of these two cartoons, if you measure the amount of 182 tungsten in a planet's mantle, um, you know, compared to other isotopes of tungsten, uh, the amount you get tells you something about how early or late core formation occurred. Uh, but the system is also sensitive to the conditions of core formation. Um, for example, the degree of metal equilibration, K. Uh, so again, we're going to look at two sort of end member situations. The first is complete core re-equilibration, which is K equals one. Um, physically, what this means is that when an impactor hits the earth, the core of that impactor is emulsified into tiny little metal droplets that slowly rain down through the magma ocean and have time to fully equilibrate as they're sinking. Uh, and so we can think about what that would do to the tungsten anomaly over time. Um, so a higher tungsten anomaly, remember, is more 182 tungsten in the mantle. Uh, so in the beginning, um, the target and the impactors mantles, uh, their anomalies are both increasing as hafnium is decaying into tungsten. Then at the time of the impact represented by this dashed line, uh, as this metal is, is sinking slowly through the magma ocean and fully equilibrating, it's gonna scour out a lot of that 182 tungsten that's been produced and draw it down into the core. So the tungsten anomaly uh, of the planet drops. And then after that, it, it sort of slowly grows again at a, a, an ever slower rate until the system goes extinct. Uh, the other sort of extreme case is core merging or K equals zero. Um, so physically, this means uh, impactor hits the earth, the core goes straight through to join the earth's core without any equilibration with the mantle. And if we think about what that does to the tungsten anomaly, uh, it starts out the same, uh, increasing with time as half time decays. But now when the impact occurs, there's no drawdown of 182 tungsten from the mantle. You just get mechanical mixing of the two mantles and you end up with sort of a weighted average tungsten anomaly. Uh, and then that continues to, to grow with time. So again, if we look at, at, at where these two situations end up, we can see that as a general rule, equilibration reduces the tungsten anomaly. Uh, so this makes um, the system sort of useful for understanding core formation, but also a bit complicated because it's affected by a number of factors. Okay, so uh, here's the results of, of some of our calculations. So I'm showing um, the median tungsten anomaly uh, over all of our Earth analogs. Um, and the error bars are our two-sided confidence interval. And we repeated, uh, this is for whole mantle equilibration, and we repeated the calculation for different amounts of metal equilibration. Um, in our model, if we 
just change one variable, um, like the amount of metal that equilibrates without changing anything else, uh, we're going to end up making an earth that doesn't look like the earth. We're going to get the mantle's composition wrong. Uh, so what we do is we take advantage of that trade-off we found uh, with the core formation model between the depth and degree of equilibration. So we, we vary the depth simultaneously uh, as we're changing the degree of metal equilibration so that we always get the right composition for the earth's mantle. Um, so the depth of equilibration um, as a fraction of the core mantle boundary is, are these numbers next to the symbols. Um, so in this case of whole mantle equilibration, uh, we get the best match to the earth, which is this horizontal dashed line, uh, for about k equals 0 0.4, uh, in excellent agreement with a, a previous study um, using a much simpler calculation. Um, and that tells us um, in that case that the depth of equilibration would be roughly 55% of the core mantle boundary on average. Um, but you can see that there's a range allowed if you sort of consider the error bars um, based on the accretion history that the Earth experienced. Um, so that's for whole mantle equilibration. Uh, we can do the same uh, calculation for a smaller amount of silicate equilibrating. So now these uh, sort of brighter blue symbols, um, the impactor core is now equilibrating with three times the mass of the impactor silicate. And what you can see is uh, it sort of shifts everything up um, so that now the best match to the earth is for something like k equals 0 0.9. Uh, and if we take that even further um, and have the impactor core only equilibrate with the impactor mantle as it's sinking, uh, we get these green uh, symbols. But now that's uh, not doing a good job of, of matching the earth uh, for any value of k. Um, so a few takeaway points uh, from this figure. One is that, uh, as we saw with the cartoon, equilibration reduces the tungsten anomaly, whether it's increasing metal equilibration going from left to right or increasing silicate equilibration going from green to blue. Um, we can say that uh, on average, uh, metal must have equilibrated with at least something like three times the impact or silicate mass uh, in order to get a good match to the Earth's tungsten anomaly. Uh, and that the uh, amount of metal that equilibrates K uh, is probably at least 0.2, because um, that's where we're just getting a match with the whole mantle case, uh, which corresponds to a depth of equilibration of less than 0.65 times the core mantle boundary pressure. Uh, so we can also use the system to look at the timing of pore formation. Um, so again, I'm showing the tungsten anomaly uh, on the vertical axis, but now each symbol uh, is, is each individual Earth analog that formed in one n-body simulation. Um, so they, they form at, at all different times. Uh, and again, the horizontal dashed line is the Earth value. Um, so plotted here is the time of last embryo accretion, uh, which you can think of sort of as a moon forming impact, maybe. Um, and so these, these uh, red symbols are for whole mantle equilibration and k equals one. Uh, and when we do this calculation, um, you can see we're getting uh, a best match to the earth for a last embryo accretion time of something on the order of like 20 to 40 million years. But if we do the same calculation at a lower value of k, now these blue symbols are for k equals 0 0.2, uh, everything shifts up. And now we're matching the Earth's tungsten anomaly for last embryo accretion times of something like 75 to maybe 175 million years, which is basically the end of our simulation. Uh, and if we fill in all the other values of k, uh, it ends up looking like this. So um, the lesson here is that there is a range of both K and formation time scales that are allowed that can reproduce the Earth's tungsten anomaly. Um, so when you're trying to use the half moon tungsten system as a chronometer, uh, you have to sort of interpret it with caution because it depends on things other than time. Um, so there's a study by Jacobson et al. in 2014 um, that argued that based on the mass of the late veneer of the Earth and dynamical constraints, um, that the, the moon forming impact um, had to have been at 65 million years or later, which is what's indicated by this white arrow. So if you believe this constraint, um, that would tell us that K cannot be greater than 0 0.55. 
because uh, if we look uh, sort of from 65 million years and later, um, all of the symbols that are sort of matching the Earth value are uh, sort of yellow, green, blue. Um, but again, we find uh, really strong trade-offs uh, now between K, the silicate mass, depth of equilibration, and also the formation time scale. Uh, but you can sort of make general statements like later formation times require lower degrees of equilibration to match the Earth. Okay, so uh, from the hafnium tungsten isotope model, um, we find all of these trade-offs again. Uh, but we're able to put some constraints on some parameters. Um, so K has to be greater than 0 0.2 uh, and less than 0 0.55 uh, if you believe uh, that constraint on the timing of the moon forming impact. Um, and those values of K correspond to an equilibration depth of about 0.5 to 0.7 times the core mantle boundary pressure. Uh, in terms of the amount of silicate that equilibrates, it has to be you know, greater than or equal to three times the impact or silicate mass. Um, so these are tighter constraints uh, on these parameters than we were able to get from just looking at, at uh, like major, minor, and trace elements uh, in our core formation model. Um, but it's important to remember that these are still just sort of effective average values for these parameters. Um, they probably all varied from impact to impact, uh, and treating them as, as, as one value for all impacts is a gross oversimplification. Um, it's just sort of the best we can do right now. Um, so hopefully it's uh, telling us some kind of information. Uh, and in the future, we're working to, to improve these models uh, with more realistic physics. Okay, so uh, in this last part of the talk, um, we're going to look at core formation in Mars. Uh, and I just wanna start out by pointing out that this is part of the PhD work of my grad student, Matt Brennan. Okay, so why are we looking at Mars? Um, we think we might have learned something about core formation on Earth, and we want to know if we can just go ahead and apply that to every other terrestrial planet we see, or if we have to treat them all as a unique case. Uh, basically, we just want to know if core formation mechanisms are going to be the same or different. Um, Mars is the next best place to look after the Earth because we have samples uh, from Mars in the form of the SNCs and other meteorites. Uh, we were particularly inspired to work on Mars uh, because of the InSight mission, uh, which currently has a seismometer sitting on the surface of Mars, um, trying to learn more about the Martian core. So the core formation model for Mars is very similar to our model for the Earth, uh, with two main differences. Um, one is that all of the results I'm going to show you here are using a prescribed mass evolution curve. We don't these are not coupled to n-body simulations yet, um, although we are uh, working both on coupling them to n-body simulations and incorporating half name tungsten isotopes. Uh, so more on that coming soon. Um, the other big difference between Earth and Mars is that Mars is uh, a lot more volatile rich. And so these calculations become very sensitive to your assumptions about the bulk volatile content in the planet. Uh, so what we've done here is uh, we've built Mars out of uh, basically CI chondrite composition that's been enriched in refractory elements by a factor of 1.9. Uh, and that comes from a study by Taylor 2013 uh, that looked sort of systematically at a bunch of lithophile volatile elements um, to see how much they were depleted in Mars. Um, but that's probably the biggest source of uncertainty in this calculation. Um, and I'm going to come back to that a bit at the end. Um, okay, so uh, here I'm showing you the Martian mantle composition that we calculated. Our composition is in the white symbols. Um, so this is basically, we assume that refractory enriched CI chondrite, we run it through a core formation model um, to make something Mars-like, and this is the composition that comes out. Um, the colored symbols that you see here are from previous studies that estimated the Martian mantle composition from SNC meteorites. <coughs> Uh, and you can see we're getting a, a pretty good match to uh, all of these major, minor, and trace elements that we're looking at. Uh, one of the first things uh, that jumps out is uh, that the FEO content of the Martian mantle is significantly higher than in the Earth's mantle. Uh, and that's telling us that core formation on Mars probably happened at a higher oxygen capacity than on the Earth. 
Okay, so then we, we tried to put constraints on some conditions of core formation in Mars. Uh, the first one we looked at was the depth of equilibration. Um, so here we're looking at uh, the amount of nickel in green, cobalt in red, or sulfur in yellow in the Martian mantle as we vary the depth of equilibration uh, going from the surface of Mars here on the left to the core mantle boundary on the right. And we're just varying the equilibration depth without changing any other parameters and just looking at how it changes the abundances of these elements in the mantle. And it produces these uh, colored lines with uncertainties. Uh, and then we looked at some of these previous studies that estimated the Martian mantle composition from the SNC meteorites. Uh, and we looked uh, to see what those values were. And that gives us these uh, green, yellow, and red shaded regions. Uh, and then we look to see what kind of equilibration depth lets us match all three elements at the same time. Of course, we looked at more than three elements, but where do they all match at the same time? Uh, and so the best match uh, for the depth of equilibration on Mars is something like 0.4 to 0.6 times the core mantle boundary. Uh, so this is pretty comparable to what we found uh, for Earth as a fraction of the core mantle boundary. Um, and you'll see already, um, this is going to depend on your assumption about volatile content because we're using sulfur as one of the elements to constrain this. Uh, but if we change the sulfur content, uh, it, it might move around a little, but it's, it's fairly well constrained by other elements in the model as well. And we can do the same kind of thing to look at the degree of metal equilibration, K. Uh, now we're looking at titanium in blue and uh, again, sulfur in yellow and cobalt in red. Uh, as we change k from 0 to 1, uh, we produce these curves. Uh, and again, the colored shaded regions are the constraints from the SNC meteorites. And where they overlap is this gray shaded region. Uh, so we find a very high degree of metal equilibration uh, on Mars is necessary to explain the mantle's composition, a k of something like 0.85 to 1. Uh, so remember, for the Earth, we found a value of 0.2 to 0.55. Um, we also looked a bit at the degree of silicate equilibration, uh, found it has a lower bound of something like 20% of the target silicate mass, which is roughly comparable to what we found for the Earth. Um, but in both cases, uh, all we can do is put sort of a, a low lower bound on it um, because composition is, is not as sensitive to the degree of silicate equilibration once you get beyond a certain point. Um, and so, the core formation model lets us uh, predict a composition for the Martian core. Uh, it's an iron rich alloy with 18 to 19 weight percent sulfur, uh, with a big asterisk that this depends on your assumption about volatile depletion in the bulk Mars, uh, as well as about seven weight percent nickel, uh, less than one weight percent oxygen, and just trace silicon. Um, so then uh, we did a little bit of geophysical modeling using uh, this composition, which we uh, hereafter approximate as just Fe with 18 weight percent sulfur. Um, so we take this, this core composition, uh, we turn our mantle composition into a modal mineralogy uh, like this, uh, and then using the, the properties of, of these minerals and that alloy, uh, we can calculate, uh, for example, density profiles uh, through Mars, uh, we can calculate uh, seismic velocity profiles, BP and VS. Um, and so we did this, this geophysical modeling uh, where we varied five parameters that are uh, very uncertain in Mars. One is the core sulfur content. Uh, we got this sort of best fit value of 18 to 19 weight percent, but we weren't very confident in that number. Um, we also varied uh, some assumptions about the density of liquid FES alloys at high pressures, um, which we parameterized as a delta V of melting, uh, the thickness of the Martian crust, the potential temperature of the Martian mantle, uh, and the temperature jump across a possible core mantle thermal boundary layer. And so we, uh, we built this like shell model from Mars, uh, varying these parameters. Uh, that's constrained to match the mass radius moment of inertia and tidal love number K2 of Mars. Uh, and so using this model, we can do things like uh, predict normal mode center frequencies and body wave travel times as a function of something like the core sulfur contents. Um, we're hoping these kinds of calculations are going to be helpful uh, to the people on the InSight team.
Uh, I should mention uh, these particular figures uh, are made by our collaborator, Jessica Irving. Uh, and the last thing we looked at was uh, to try to make um, some prediction of what the Martian core radius might be. Um, so these are the same uh, five variables I just mentioned in the geophysical model. Um, we put together uh, this very empirical expression um, for how the radius of the Martian core uh, depends on these five variables um, if you're constraining the model to match the, the geophysical observations. Uh, and this figure is basically just a graphical expression of that. So this is uh, for a fixed crustal thickness of 55 kilometers. Uh, each column is a different delta V of melting in the FES system. Each row is a different mantle potential temperature. And then within each panel, the horizontal axis is the core sulfur content and the vertical axis is the temperature dump at the core mantle boundary. And then the different colored regions are different core radii for Mars. Uh, and I, I wanted to mention this uh, because uh, a few weeks ago at the LPSC meeting, um, there was a presentation by Stellar et al. Uh, from the Insight team uh, that announced that they have seismic observations of the Martian core uh, with a radius of 1810 to 1860 kilometers, uh, which would plot in the yellow to orange field on this figure. Um, so I, I attempted to throw some stars on here, like approximating where that would be. Um, so if we if we look at that kind of core radius um, compared to our sort of empirical expression for what gives you different core radii, uh, this requires a pretty high sulfur content in the Martian core. Um, it's possible to do it with about 18 weight percent, which was our preferred value, but that requires very particular combination of parameters. It's it's likely it requires more than that. Um, so it's possible that Mars is less volatile depleted or at least less sulfur depleted than we thought. Um, this kind of large core is also favored by a hotter mantle, uh, a hotter core, a larger delta V of melting in the FES system, and a thicker crust. Okay, so just to conclude, um, we started out by seeing how accretion simulations and metal silicate partitioning experiments are important prerequisites to, to modeling the core formation process. Uh, in our model, we find strong trade-offs between the depth, timing, and degree of metal silicate equilibration, and the, the core and mantle compositions are most sensitive to the depth and degree of equilibration and the accretion history of the Earth. Uh, for Earth's core, we predict about five and a half weight percent silicon and two weight percent oxygen, possibly with small amounts of sulfur, carbon, and or hydrogen. For the Martian core, uh, we predict about 18 weight percent sulfur, uh, although we may now have to revise that upwards. Uh, as well as less than one weight percent oxygen and negligible silicon. And these differences in the core compositions of Earth and Mars are partly due to the size difference between the two planets, very different pressures and temperatures of core formation, uh, but also the different oxygen fugacities uh, and different volatile contents. Uh, we find very different degrees of metal equilibration uh, for these two planets, something like 0.2 to 0.55 for the Earth and greater than 0.85 for Mars. Uh, to speculate for a moment, um, maybe that's related to the Earth having more giant impacts, uh, since larger impactor cores would be less likely to fully equilibrate. Uh, maybe Mars had more undifferentiated impactors, um, since they would likely exhibit a very high degree of equilibration. Uh, we can rule out very small amounts of silicate equilibration for Earth and Mars, but otherwise uh, can't put super tight constraints on that. Uh, the depth of equilibration on both planets is, uh, on average, something like 0.4 to 0.7 times the core mantle boundary, uh, which might uh, suggest similar relative extents of melting on the two planets. Uh, I'd just like to end by acknowledging uh, a bunch of people who were involved in this work and various funding sources. Thank you. Yay. Great. And uh, really uh, comprehensive and uh, kind of um, giving the backgrounds as well as uh, sophisticated the modeling and uh, give a broad understanding of the core formation process and linking to the composition of the core. And uh, so I'm opening for questions. I see a couple of hands is up and uh, uh, why don't I just start with uh, whoever is on the top, I think, uh, Kano. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I, you were uh, 
You spent quite a bit of time looking at the uncertainties in your models based on degree of equilibration and uh, uh, impacting uh, angle, etc. But what you didn't talk about is you must have to assume uh, gradients in the mass distribution and redox state of your uh, planetesimals. Um, and how sensitive are your models to, to those parameters? Uh, that's a great question. Um, in terms of the mass distribution at the beginning of the unbody simulations, um, we've just started to look at that a little bit. Um, there aren't many suites of n-body simulations that have like a large number of simulations with different mass distributions. Um, but there's one from Jacobson et al. Uh, and there's a study by ZB et al. that looked at the effects on the Hafni and tungsten, and they didn't see any significant differences um, for different mass distributions. Um, but the, the initial FO2 gradient, uh, I, yes, I completely glossed over that. It's a huge source of uncertainty. Um, you have to make yeah, basically there's there's two schools of thought about how you, you treat the FO2 of core formation. Uh, some people assume a core, uh, an FO2 history uh, and they, they do the calculation at a series of different FO2s that they prescribe beforehand. Um, I belong to the other school of thought um, that was sort of invented by Dave Ruby, which is that you assume an initial FO2 and then you evolve itself consistently. You have to assume something. Um, we're constrained by the fact that we, we want to match the FO2 of the Earth in the end, um, in terms of at least the FeO content of the mantle relative to the iron content of the core. Um, even that is not necessarily a great constraint because there can be post-core formation processes that change the redox state. Um, but there's, there's a finite range of initial FO2 that will get you there. Um, so what we, what we do to try and sort of constrain it uh, is we run the model on Earth and Mars simultaneously, uh, since they're accreting mostly from different parts of the disk and they have different FO2. Uh, and we try and find some kind of FO2 gradient that will let us reproduce both of them at the same time. But do we really know okay. where, the, where Mars formed? Certainly in the stochastic processes, even Mars's orbit could uh, be all over the place. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. We, we look at a bunch of unbody simulations uh, that don't really form all that many Mars analogs. And then we just try and get some good fraction of them to come out with the right FO2. Uh, it's definitely not an exact science. Thanks. Great. Great. And uh, I, I do want to mention uh, after the general discussions, the postdocs should stay on and uh, have a, a, a little bit more uh, conversation with uh, uh, Rebecca and uh, uh, we should give her a break um, between the postdocs and then there's a, a general discussion at uh, 1.30. So people who is really interested in the topic can come back on 1.30. So uh, I think Larry is next. Uh, thanks. Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, uh, Connell asked a little bit of what I was going to ask, but uh, on this issue of your your degeneracies between the depth and degree of equilibration on this, these are like you said, these are serious trade offs. You mentioned that you're planning to add more physics to the models to address that. So, what kind of physics do you need to add in the models that will actually get rid of those degeneracies? So one of my students, uh, Jesse Gu, is, is working on a model where he's using a parameterization developed by Miki Nakajima for the extent of melting that you get in an impact. Uh, and we're, we're trying to use that to, to get at the depth of equilibration uh, in order to put some constraints then on the degree of equilibration. Okay. Uh, there's also some really interesting um, like fluid dynamics experiments, um, like from Jagan et al. Um, looking at, at things like the degree of equilibration, um, but we have not been able to get those to work out with the modeling of the Hafnium tungsten system. So we're not quite sure what the issue is there. Okay, thanks. Can, can, just yeah. really quickly, just one thing that in your, your conclusions, you mentioned that maybe Mars had undifferentiated impactors because they would have a high degree of equilibration. I don't understand that. Why would undifferentiated ones equilibrate more than differentiated ones? Uh, um, so the idea is that uh, differentiated bodies are more likely to only partially equilibrate because the core is so big. If it doesn't emulsify on impact, it might sink really quickly and like only the outside of it would equilibrate. 
Um, whereas if, if it's undifferentiated, you'd have smaller bits. Okay. Uh, Matt? Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess my question is kind of similar to Connell's and along the lines of Larry's too. Uh, so first of all, like where did like where did you take the you know the Mars accretion histories from? Are those just directly from the Mars planets or anything that forms outside of Earth analog in the same simulations? And then also, you know, you talked a lot about um, constraints as far as when the material is delivered. Um, but what constraints can you put on, you know, how much material from where can be delivered late, right? Like, can you have a lot of late delivery from the outer part of the disk on Earth or Mars, for example? Um, okay, so your first question, um, the results I just showed you from Mars are not based on n-body simulations, um, but the stuff we're starting to do with that, um, we're using a bunch of different EJS, CJS, and Grand Tax simulations. And we've played around a lot with the definition of what a Mars is. Um, of course, it has to be something that's fairly small um, and farther out from the sun than the Earth is. Um, but it turns out uh, it's not super sensitive to like where you put the cutoff in terms of semi-major axis. Um, so that's, we've been, we've been sort of playing around with that. Um, uh, your other question, oh, about where uh, material was accreted from and when. Um, so, I mean, you could look directly at the end body simulation and see when material is accreted from different places. In terms of the chemistry, you can only constrain that by imposing like an FO2 gradient and seeing like how much oxidized material you can accrete late um, or how much volatile rich material and you're imposing a volatile gradient. Um, but then in that case, your, your answer is going to be completely dependent on the gradient you impose. Uh, Francisco? Hi. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for the talk. It's very nice. Uh, I, I have a question. For, I'm curious about your opinion because uh, where you were showing partitioning model for, from experiment and like previous experiments. So I was wondering what is your take in how to reconcile what you get from your partitioning model and what come out from like uh, mineral physics studies. Because there are some papers like, for instance, there are some experimental paper in which they show that, for instance, like an iron silicon oxygen core might be difficult. This is a matter of like, it's a debate actually between groups, but as well as also like, Iron, uh, iron sulfur carbon. There are some studies in large volume. Uh, me, myself, I've done some work on iron silicon carbon. And uh, I was wondering how your uh, four elements solution, so um, iron silicon sulfur carbon, stand uh, in respect to uh, James 2004, 2000, 2014 and 15 PNAS paper, when he, he actually gives some range of composition. So. I was wondering what, what is your take on that? Yeah, um, two things. I'll, I'll say I'm, I'm, I will not like marry myself to this composition. It's, it's, not, uh, it's certainly not a unique solution. Um, really, we need to, to have all of the elements in the same experiment and all of the elements in the same model if we want to get the right answer. Um, this, I'm hoping this is somewhere in the right ballpark, um, but it's not exact. Um, but this, this kind of calculation has absolutely no physics in it, right? Like I, okay. that composition is solely based on the metal silicate partitioning um, without any consideration exactly of the density or the sound velocities. Um, so it, yeah, it, it might not work in terms of those things, but you also, you can't do, you can't just propose a model that works in terms of sound velocity if there's no way to get the elements there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, we really need to, to couple the two better. Okay, thank you. I have some more questions that I will wait, wait for later. Okay. okay, great. And I think John has a question, John Chambers. Yeah, great talk, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Um, quick question, given that uh, time scale is something that you have to disentangle from other aspects of the model, is there a suitable second isotope system apart from times and half, you know, with a different 
half-life that might help you disentangle the time scale from other things? Uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. There's been a, uh, at least one or two studies that, that coupled it with uranium lead. Um, we, we are, are starting to look also at, at some like noble gas isotope systems. Um, palladium silver we're working on. Um, I almost forgot I'm working on palladium silver. Yeah, um, so there, there's other systems that could potentially be useful. We don't necessarily have the partitioning data in all of them yet. Um, so we're, we're starting by working on that. Well, that's great. And I mean, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to wait until 1.30 and uh, I'm going to give a, a, a floor to the postdoc, then then maybe I can uh, ask you more questions. So, so I will uh, log out and uh, some of the staff can